Thank you so much for helping this to be a wonderful day. I don't know specifically what you prayed for, 52 of you, yesterday when you gathered to think about this meeting and the opportunities we have before us. But if one of those things was encouraging a preacher and encouraging his family, then you have already accomplished that. Uh, it has just been outstanding <laughs> the way that you have been so kind and hospitable. I don't know that I've seen a potluck meal with as many choices of food as we have this afternoon. I felt morally obligated to eat a little bit of all of it, and I regretted that decision later on uh, this afternoon, but uh, you have been so gracious, and I'm looking forward to thinking about this week what it means uh, to have self-control. Unfortunately, I lacked a little bit of that at the fellowship meal uh, this afternoon, but to be thankful for the fact, as we talked about this morning, that in a world that's out of control, in a world uh, where the words of Galatians 5, 19 through 21 describe, unfortunately, what it looks like to live by our own lust rather than living by the Spirit and what it is God desires for us to be, uh, we can get misguided on the wrong course. But as we thought about in worship this morning, one of those nine fruit of the Spirit, the last in that list of Galatians 5, 22 and 23, is self-control. God control. What does it mean to uh, live a life that is marked by His will and His desires? You can see this week at night, our thoughts are going to be focused on four specific areas where I pray that we will allow the Lord to lead us by His will and His word. What is it that He desires for our minds? That's where we start. Then what about our eyes and our mouth and our body? What does it mean to be given fully to God's will? I pray that this week, as we discussed briefly this morning, we'll think about someone in our life that we would encourage to join us for this study, perhaps praying for that person by name, remembering that those who are not yet in Christ are not the enemy. Those are the ones who we pray will have the opportunity to come to know the joy of knowing Jesus in an intimate way like we do, wearing his name, sharing a common destiny and a common purpose. But I want to think tonight for just a few minutes about how easy it is to draw the wrong conclusions about what God wants. To draw the wrong conclusions because of the way that our minds work. I heard of a couple of college students who had a weird ritual. Every afternoon they would go down to the end of town to a big cemetery where there was a pecan tree. And they would sit down in the shade of that pecan tree. Each of them had a bucket. And they would just take turns throwing pecans at their bucket. They would go back and forth and fill their bucket and eventually go back to school and sell these pecans to help, uh, you know, pay for expenses. I don't know where they went to school because selling pecans won't buy much these days. But they were doing that nonetheless. And so they would go back and forth, one for you, one for me, one for you, one for me, counting those pecans. One day they were in that cemetery behind that iron fence up under that pecan tree and a little boy was walking by. And he wasn't really sure what was going on. He couldn't see anything, but he heard two voices coming from the cemetery. One for you and one for me. One for you and one for me. And you could notice that every now and then one of those pecans would come rolling over the hill. And he thought something strange is going on there. So he ran towards town and he found this older gentleman who could barely make his way with that cane. And he said, sir, sir, something terrible is happening at the cemetery. So they went back down there and he said, I think it's Satan and Jesus discussing souls. They're there in the cemetery and they're saying, one for you and one for me. The old man said, surely not. Well, the more he listened, the more that old man began to wonder until finally they heard a voice come from over the hill that said, all right, that's all of them here. Let's go get those two nuts down by the fence and we'll be on our way. And they said the old man made it back to town before they did. Sometimes our minds can lead us to draw the wrong conclusions. And when we think about allowing the Lord to take control, that's really where it starts. There's a battle going on. And we read words about warfare in Scripture, but we're not talking about the kinds of warfare, the kinds of images that we see sometimes sadly on television. We're talking about a spiritual warfare. We're talking about the words of Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 that describe the whole armor of God. And tonight, let's be reminded of the fact that our enemy is not our brothers and sisters. It's not the one who is outside of Christ. Ultimately, our enemy is Satan. And the way that Peter describes Satan is rather powerful. He's not just described as a serpent, the serpent of old, as is mentioned in Revelation 12, or obviously 
in the Garden of Eden where that serpent encounters Eve and deceives her and she in turn deceives Adam. But uh, instead, Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, that the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He is actively pursuing prey. He is seeking out an opportunity to use us rather than to glorify God, to use us to destroy ourselves and ultimately bring down others around us who are looking for good examples, but sometimes because of what starts in our minds, they see something very different than that. There's a battle going on, and the battleground is in our mind. And the question tonight is, what will I do with the opportunities I have to do exactly what the Apostle Paul talked about in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2? If you've got a Bible tonight, I want to go there first. And look at what Paul says in this passage. It's a passage we think about an awful lot. When the Apostle Paul, in this point of transition, in what may be the most magnificent letter that Paul wrote, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, starts this verse with the word, therefore. One of my favorite preachers, Jay Lockhart, talked about how sometimes when you see the word therefore, you have to ask, what's therefore, therefore? What's the word therefore, therefore, in Romans 12, verse 1? Well, it recommends to us that this is a continuation of a previous thought. When Paul says, therefore I urge you, by the mercies of God, that three word phrase, mercies of God, if you've read the whole letter to the Romans, summarizes chapters 1 through 11. If you want to see the mercies of God, read Romans 1 through 11. You find out in that section of this beautiful letter exactly how merciful God has been. The fact that we are all alienated from God. It didn't matter what our race or background was. We all made the decision to rebel against them. We know the words of Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, that the wages of sin is death. But then you hit Romans chapter 5 and we're reminded that while we were sinners, while we were enemies, while we were alienated, Christ died for us. And because of God's gracious initiative, because He sacrificially expressed His will, we have been given an opportunity to respond to His grace in faith. So in recalling all of that material in the first 11 chapters, recalling all the things that God has done for us, Paul writes in Romans 12, starting in verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, present, what does he say here? Your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. He continues in verse 2, Live differently, right? Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. That's where it starts. By the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. There's a war going on, and we have a choice to make. We can get bogged down in the things below and focus on the bad news. Isn't there a lot of bad news? In recent weeks, haven't we been reminded of the fact that sometimes things can appear to be great, whether we're talking about a guy who sold subs, or a guy who's a part of a famous TV family, or a guy who's traveled the world for years as a famous comedian. Sometimes things on the outside look great, but on the inside there's a battle going on, and decisions are made. Not that those decisions are unforgettable, but ultimately we have a choice. And ultimately, what's happening in here, in this battleground, where we have the opportunity to focus on things above, as Paul says in Colossians 3, rather than on things below, will be expressed in how we treat others. What we say, what we do, what we spend our time focusing on, what habitual activity we find ourselves engaged in. And so tonight, I want to think for just a few minutes about what we think about I know that that might seem awkward, and to be honest with you, this whole series of lessons has been really challenging in terms of my own life. What does it mean for me to allow the Lord to take control? And I pray that as we think about these things tonight, we'll be reminded of the fact that wherever we find ourselves, whatever our state might be spiritually, the good news tonight is that at this moment, it is not too late for all things to be made right through Jesus Christ. Sometimes you hear the Word of God presented and you leave wondering, is it good news or bad news? Well, tonight we want to be reminded that this is good news. And despite what our situation might be, 
The blood of Jesus is still as effective tonight as it's ever been. We still tonight have an opportunity to be found pleasing to God, regardless of what kind of sinful activity we've been involved with in the past or that we might be involved with in the present. Sometimes I hear people talk about sin as if it indicates that we're somehow forever broken, that there's no hope. But grace is not just a historical act at the cross of Jesus. It's a continuous offer that you and I tonight still have opportunity to respond to in faith with full appreciation for what God has done, what He will do, and what He is doing right now through His Word as we study these passages together. I don't know what you spend your time thinking about. Maybe sometimes you have a sleepless night. Maybe as you're mowing the grass or driving down the road. Maybe in those moments of solitude. Maybe even in the shower. Wherever that might be. What do you find yourself thinking about? Perhaps your family, your future, your finances, your feelings, your faith. What is it that we spend our time thinking about? Tonight I want to talk for just a few minutes about those most private thoughts. The kinds of thoughts that you might not ever express verbally to someone else. Not even those who are closest to you. What is it that we spend our time thinking about? A book that I've appreciated through the years by Gordon MacDonald titled When Men Think Private Thoughts talks about the tendency not only among men but also among women. For in our interpersonal world, that internal conversation that takes place in our minds. We are continually thinking in that way. And for many of us, those thoughts might lean towards something called scorekeeping. Now this has nothing to do with soccer or football. This has everything to do with the fact that sometimes in our world, we look around and we think about where we stand. We think about our possessions. We think about our example. We think about where we stand. What's our status? And this ultimately leads us to either contentment or unsettlement. This leads us either to be determined or to feel defeated. So as you're shouting, as you're driving, as you're in a boring meeting or maybe even listening to a boring sermon, as you're mowing the grass, where does your mind go? What do you think about? Are you spending that time comparing yourself to other people? Are you thinking about your house or your car or your health or your job? Are you thinking about how to keep up with somebody else? Are you thinking about your failure? Are you thinking about regrets and guilt? Are we looking in the past with gratitude or are we looking at the past wondering, how can I be such a failure? Why don't I have what so-and-so has? You know, sometimes it's easy for us to hide what's really going on in our mind. Sometimes it's easy for us to be losing that battle and to never really share with someone else that internal dialogue, that internal conversation, that struggle that can be a real part of who we are. And the Apostle Paul understood that. As he was discussing his most terrible suffering, remember what he talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and 11 and 12? We often look at those passages and we think about his being shipwrecked and his being imprisoned and stoned and beaten with rods. But you know what I think oppressed Paul more than any of those other sufferings? He explains it there in 2 Corinthians 11. The daily concern of all of those congregations, the daily concern of all of that pressure, the daily concern of those in Corinth or Galatia or wherever he might be serving who are questioning his credibility and in turn questioning the gospel that Paul had proclaimed. Perhaps Paul understood what those internal private conversations were really all about. Perhaps that's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5, he warns about judgmental attitudes. Remember what Jesus says in Matthew 7 verses 1 through 6 about not judging? Sometimes that verse gets misused because in verse 6, Jesus makes it clear that we've got to be able to discern between what is good and what is evil. That we ought to know what's righteous and what's not righteous. Well, the Apostle Paul understood that. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5, notice what he wrote there by inspiration. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. You know, ultimately, I think some of us are ridden with guilt and constantly having an internal conversation that leads us feeling worse. 
Because we perhaps think that our internal conversations are much worse than anyone else's. And tonight, perhaps better than any other strategy to begin with, we ought to think about how we respond when certain things cross our minds. For example, if you think about the past, generally, is that a good thing or not a good thing? Now, someone here tonight might say, well, just recently I became a Christian, and so much of my past is sadly marked by sin and rebellion. But even then, can't we look back? Doesn't the Apostle Paul in Acts 22 and 26, and Philippians 2, and on other occasions when he looks back in the rearview mirror and thinks about what life was like before he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus in Acts 9, he's able even then to say that some good things came out of those bad years. That despite his persecuting the church, persecuting the way of God, that he learned how to be zealous, that he learned the law, that he, in those moments of anguish, learned some things that blessed him later in life. I wonder if King David ever looked back to shepherding Jesse's flock, fighting the lion and the bear before 1 Samuel 17 and Goliath. I'm convinced that if David had never shepherded his father's flock, he would have never have been prepared to face Goliath or ultimately to be king of Israel. It was in those few moments, in those sad moments, as his brother once accused him, where have you left those few sheep? Were it not for those few sheep, David would not have been able to have had the success he has later in life. When you think about the past, is it generally a bad thing or a good thing? What about the present? What about life right now? Do you believe that your life at this moment is overall a success or a failure? Is that generally a positive thought or a negative thought? What about the what if game? Do you ever play the what if game? What if I had done this? What if I had owned that? What if she? What if he? What if my father? What if my job? You ever play the what if game? Is that what if game generally filled with negative thoughts? Is that generally filled with regret and guilt? Not all guilt is bad. Paul says in that same epistle, 2 Corinthians, that godly sorrow can lead to repentance in chapter 9 of that wonderful letter. But the what if game can be destructive. What about your self-worth? Do you feel like you have value in the world? Do you feel like anybody knows you? Anybody really cares about you? What about the future? Does it look bright or bleak? Is it something that you look forward to? Do you look forward to waking up in the morning having the opportunity to be a servant of our God for another day? Or do we dread what it might be that's on the horizon tomorrow? And then for a lot of people, I wonder about the last one here. What about death? How will I die when I die? When will it happen? What will happen to my possessions or my family? Ultimately, where will I spend eternity? When you start thinking about those things, when that conversation starts playing out in your head, is that a conversation that the Lord has control of? Or is that a conversation that that roaring lion who is seeking to devour us and defeat us enjoys watching basically make you miserable as you replay those thoughts in your mind of those sleepless nights? I think tonight, if I were able to take exactly what's in your mind in those moments and put it right up here on the screens, what we would discover is most of us think about the same sorts of things. Most of us have the same sorts of struggles. We are not alone. We are not worse off than anyone else. Basically, if we can put all of our thoughts one at a time up here on the screen, I know immediately some people who would think I would be terrified and horrified because I'm such a bad person. My thoughts are so much worse than anyone else's. People, if they saw what I was thinking, would think I'm shallow and evil and ignorant and insecure. Maybe somebody would look at our thoughts and think we're arrogant or egotistical or selfish. But you know what I think? I think we would discover that we're all human. That we've all sinned, those of us who are accountable. That we all understand what it means to fail. That we all have anxiety. That we all have hope. That we all have days in which we succeed and days in which we fail. And tonight what I want to do is offer four very practical suggestions from Scripture regarding how we can begin to let that internal conversation develop into something that honors God, even when no one else even knows what's happening in our minds. Let's allow that to be something that brings glory and honor to God. 
And if we do that, I believe what happens with what we see, what we say, what we do with our bodies, how we treat other people, how we use our time, how we respond to trials or controversy will all be affected in a positive manner. We begin to allow the Lord to take control of our mind. Four things. Let's start in the same epistle we thought about a little bit already tonight. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 6. In this chapter, which often is thought about with regard to the Holy Spirit, where Paul spends a lot of time talking about him and his work, I think Paul says something here that is as relevant for us tonight as it was in the first century A.D. when he first penned these words to the Christians in Rome. In Romans 8, starting in verse 6, notice what the Apostle Paul writes there, going down through verse 8. The mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, it does not subject itself to the law of God, it's not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You know, in a crowd like this, where we have so many people who love the Lord and who want to do His will, who are interested in being found pleasing to Him, I believe that many of us have already made Jesus Christ the focal point of our life. We desire with all of our hearts to be spiritual. We think about Jesus more than perhaps we think about any other individual, and that's appropriate. And you might ask me, well, how do you know that? I'm certainly not a prophet. But I think from what we've heard people talking about today, the responses we've seen in so many ways to this meeting and opportunities we have to tell others about Jesus highlight for us the fact that when we talk about this and when we attend services of the Lord's assembly, we are reminded in a vivid way what it means to allow Jesus to be the focal point of our life. But you know, that's not always the case. One of the things I love about preaching is being able after the sermon to visit with people. And you'd be amazed sometimes what you hear. You know, I remember my dad telling me, uh, he's a little bit older than I am, obviously about 20 years older than I am. He uh, said, you know, for a long time people would come out and they would say, son, one day you'll be a good preacher. And then finally they just stopped saying that. And he wondered if there was a five minute window in there somewhere where he actually was a good preacher. He wasn't sure about that. You'd be surprised what sometimes people talk about. Through the years, I've been surprised that so soon after the service is over, you can hear people talking about all sorts of things, even in the church building. Not that this is a holier space than any other space. But when you hear certain jokes or certain words, when you hear people clearly giving their priority to things that are not of God, doesn't it just make your stomach hurt? Doesn't it just break our hearts to think about the fact that sometimes we're playing a game? That sometimes people are interested in making others believe, making others feel like we're all here for the right reason. We really do love Jesus. We're focused on Him. But what's that internal conversation in our head really about? Is it really about Him and His goals and His desires and the power He has in our lives to make all wrongs right? Or is it simply about failure and guilt or perhaps at the other end of the spectrum, arrogance and pride. You might wonder, well, how can I, starting tomorrow morning, do a better job with this? Maybe it's something as simple as putting Scripture in places where you can't miss it. I've got buddies who put post-it notes everywhere. They're on their bathroom mirror, and they're on the steering wheel of the car, and they're on their computer screen at work, and wherever they look, they're reminded constantly about Scripture. Perhaps it's a someone that, who can hold you accountable. Someone who can call you on the phone randomly and ask you questions to make sure that your thoughts are giving glory and honor to God. Now you can certainly hide that, and I'm not suggesting in any form or fashion that prayer and Bible study somehow magically alleviate us from having that internal conversation still that doesn't bring honor to God. What we have to do is using God's Word as our guide create ways to continually remind ourselves in here, not just outwardly. You know, when Jesus talked about being born again with Nicodemus, it wasn't just the water, it's the spirit. It's not just an external change, it's an internal change. In the next chapter, John 4, when he talked to the Samaritan woman about worship 
He said it's not just about truth, external. It's about spirit, making sure our worship is in the right form, according to the right heart. Well, if that's true about baptism and worship, isn't that also true about the Christian life? That we can outwardly do all kinds of things. Remember 1 Corinthians 13, the way it starts? How ultimately we can do all kinds of things. Even be martyred. But if we don't have love, what is it? That's where it starts, isn't it? Beginning with a commitment to live according to the Spirit, as Paul says, not according to the flesh. And then once we have committed ourselves to that, and we're reminded every single day through good habits that that conversation must glorify God, what do we do next? We make sure that every single thing we do is held to that standard. Everything we think, that internal conversation, that ongoing dialogue is always held to the standard of Jesus Christ. You know, it might be obvious from what I ate earlier today, I'm a carnivore. I really like meat. And I'm not always really good at grilling meat, but I do know enough to understand this. The difference between a good steak and a great steak is letting that steak marinate. Letting it just soak up those spices Letting it get ready to put on the grill. i got to be talking about this. But the ultimate idea here is, if I am going to allow Jesus to truly be the Lord of that internal conversation, I've got to make sure I don't just compartmentalize my life. Where I've got work here, family here, the church here. Where instead the Lord consumes all of those things that are taking place in my mind as I'm striving to give glory and honor to Him. Training myself to let my mind marinate in Christ. Soaking up faith in a way that honors our Lord. Soaking up what it means to focus on Him. Letting Him control my mind. You know, again, I'm amazed at how unfortunate it is to see the church divided by slander and hypocrisy. And ultimately, people who are motivated by greed. Those are all expressions of the kinds of things that can take up residence in our hearts if we do not allow Jesus Christ to guide that conversation that we're having internally. I can't live like the rest of the world all week and stroll in here on the first day of the week and think that for two hours every week I can go through the motions and expect the Lord to see something in my life that honors Him and that encourages other people. We're not perfect. And that's the great thing about grace. It's not getting it all right. It's allowing the Lord to Guide us through His Word as we habitually walk in the light as He is in the light. That's the language of Romans 12, 1 and 2. Not being conformed to this world, but being transformed. This next step may be the hardest. Because we make Jesus Christ the focal point of our life. We determine to hold everything to that standard. And then what do we have to do? We have to take out the trash. You know, some of us have unfortunately, this is the toughest part for me. We have allowed some stuff in. We've allowed some angry words in. We've allowed some people to perhaps influence us for evil. We have allowed our own lust to take control rather than letting the Lord take control. And Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 said something along these lines as well, namely verse 11. You know, sometimes, again, we get the wrong impression that God's people have to be perfect. If we could be perfect, we wouldn't need Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul's looking back on the lives of those Christians that he's now commending for their faith. And in verse 11, he's talking about all these terrible sins and terrible thoughts. And he says, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. In order for me to let the Lord control my mind, I've got to remove things from my mind that do not honor Him. You know, perhaps tonight we might think that's impossible. It's just not realistic for me to be able to avoid evil in this life. I'm not suggesting that we avoid evil in terms of being able to live in a bubble. What I am suggesting is that we shun meditating on evil, that we shun feeding ourselves with things that unfortunately bring about bad health spiritually. I've had to learn the hard way that if you eat junk, you feel like junk. That if you eat things that raise your blood sugar, you're going to have problems. If you eat things that 
bring about physical discomfort, it will affect your body. It's pretty basic. If I fill my mind with filth, if I allow things into my mind that are not God-honoring, you know, we have so many ways that these kinds of things can come into our homes. Sometimes those are things that are not evil in and of themselves. There's nothing evil about a television set. There's nothing evil about a computer. There's nothing evil about the music or the movies that can quickly fill our home. But an awareness of what these kinds of things do, an awareness of how we can quickly be desensitized to what it means to allow things that are crass and dishonorable in the eyes of God to fill our minds. And what happens? Eventually we become more and more accustomed to that kind of behavior. And as we looked at this morning briefly in Romans 1, on three occasions Paul says that if we allow sin to take root, it will be handed over and it will just become worse and worse in our lives. we got to take out the trash. We can talk about specific channels, but ultimately the standard here is if Jesus wouldn't watch it with us, if Jesus wouldn't be pleased by those lyrics, if Jesus wouldn't be pleased by that website, I need to do my best to avoid it. And it's not just about avoiding that. It's making sure that I resist the temptation to engage in activity just because it's popular, just because the world approves. That's important for parents to understand what the children are listening to and for parents to listen to things that their children will not be ashamed when they hear that kind of music, when they see that kind of thing, when they engage in certain online activities. There's all kinds of trash. We've got to be intentional about what we teach and what we represent because if we step back and say, I'm not going to be intentional about being a parent, I'm not going to be intentional about being a church leader, I'm not going to be intentional about being a Christian, there's that roaring lion thanking us for the fact that now he has that opportunity. The world will gladly teach our children about anything they ask about. That's why we've got to be intentional and take out the trash. Well, now I've got a vacuum there. I've got something to fill. What do I fill it with? Well, back to our focal point tonight. I fill it with things from above. We've talked about this passage a couple of times today. But in Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1, we get that word, therefore, again. Paul writes, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. You know how we can fail in setting our minds on things above? We never let God's word in. We never spend any time communicating with God. We never spend any time developing our faith or telling anybody about our faith. Instead, we surround ourselves only with things that are, that are from the world. Only with activities that are dishonorable. Only with opportunities to shun faith and focus on the stuff down here only. And not allow the Lord to lead that internal conversation where ultimately everything takes root. Brother Ray mentioned this morning that 10 years ago yesterday, Christy and I had been living in Baton Rouge for about 14 months when Hurricane Katrina came. And initially it wasn't that big a deal because the levees held, but a couple of hours later, when the levees gave way and unfortunately New Orleans was in a bowl and water came in from every direction, the mass exodus began. We were 66 miles or so from New Orleans and we were inundated with people our elders wisely allowed us to use our fellowship hall. They said, get on the radio. At that time, all the Clear Channel stations were broadcasting the same signal. They said, get on the radio and tell, tell listeners, because people were just sitting on I-10, not having anywhere to go, anywhere to stay. They said, you know, just say that we'll take the first 100 people who can get here. Within 20 minutes, we had 156. Well, I'd love to see people rush to a church building like that on Sunday. <laughs> Amen. 156. And for the next month, they were our guests. They were our friends. We were inconvenienced by that. We were overwhelmed by that. But you know what? We didn't have electricity in our homes and our food was going to spoil, so we cooked for our guests. We couldn't go home in that heat anyway, that summer Louisiana heat. We all stayed at the church building. We made friendships that would last. And I was amazed as I watched people whose houses were underwater who seemingly had lost all their worldly possessions. 
People who had not yet come to know Jesus, many of them would come to know Jesus because of what the church did. I was amazed when Sunday rolled around and we said to that group of people, listen, we're going to be worshiping together on Sunday and you're welcome to join us if you would like. We're not going to make you walk to the other end of the building where auditorium is. You can come as you are. I'm going to be dressed like I am because I understand that many of you do not have the kind of clothing you would normally wear in a setting like this. And all but two people made the walk down the hall for worship that week. And I was blown away as I looked around that auditorium and I saw people who had seemingly lost everything, reaching into their pockets and putting change in the collection plates. People who had never been in a worship service before coming out, hey, where was the chorus? I said, you were a part of it. We were all singing together, making melody in our hearts of the Lord this morning, asking for copies of the Bible. And as a result of a horrible tragedy, so many people had the opportunity in the midst of what seemed like hopeless despair to begin thinking about something better. And I'm thankful to report that despite all the horrific things that took place in the aftermath of Katrina, that every one of those 156 people were, were carried to safety, they found work, they found housing, the, the elders helped make sure that that happened with every single one of those guests. What an incredible blessing that was to be reminded of what it means for that internal conversation. There's been a storm, our possessions are underwater. What are we going to do? We're straight on the interstate with our pets and our children to suddenly thinking we have an opportunity to start again. One of my fondest memories from that experience was one night, there was a couple, they had, I believe, five children. They had Bible names, Cornelius and Naomi. They were living together. They had never been married, and Cornelius was not a Christian. He came to me, tears rolling down his cheeks. He said, Brother Doug, I, I want to be baptized. And as soon as I'm baptized, we're going to have a wedding. What a powerful moment. To see a man ready to commit himself, tired of the filth that surrounded him, tired of hopelessness, to make tangible changes because a conversation in his mind had changed. Tonight I understand that private thoughts are private thoughts. We're not really able to put your thoughts on the screen or I'll be thankful sometimes. But tonight I plead with you that if that conversation on a daily basis is dragging you down and causing you to look back or forward, causing you to look up, causing you to look out at others, and instead of focusing on opportunity and hope and salvation, we're only focusing on failure, hopelessness, feeling lost. I pray that tonight, like those in the aftermath of that terrible experience, someone here it might be in private, will begin to allow the focal point of Jesus Christ to be our standard, holding everything to that, taking out the filth, and making sure that from this point forward, we fill that gap with only the things that are set above. You can't do it by yourself. You know, growing up, I love those Rambo movies. I know they were violent. But I love the thought that one guy to take a slingshot and defeat a whole army. I realize that's Hollywood. That's not real life. There's no Rambo Christianity. We need each other. We've got to rely on each other. We've got to bear one another's burdens. But ultimately, that same passage, Galatians 6, makes us realize that there are some burdens that only I can bear and only you can bear. And tonight, if you're bearing a burden, even if no one else in the world knows about it, Jesus cares about that burden enough that he laid down his life according to the will of the Father so that we don't have to walk with that burden anymore. And I beg you, because everything else in life is affected by that conversation, those private thoughts, let's allow the Lord to truly be Lord, not just in word, not just with regard to our ultimate salvation, but with regard to our daily walk and service. It will bless everyone around you. It will bless you in ways that are unimaginable, if we will allow that conversation to be guided by our God as we allow Him to take control of our mind.
Tonight I recognize that many of us, if not the majority of us, have come in contact with the blood of Jesus. And because of that, we now can be transformed by the renewing of our mind, living according to His will. You responded in faith, acknowledging that there was something insufficient about your way. You responded in faith, confessing with your lips and life that Jesus is Lord. Turning from sin and acknowledging His way is better, being immersed in the waters of baptism, representing His blood. So that from that day forward, your walk could be different. If you've not made that decision tonight, there's no greater decision you can ever make. And if we have, let's make sure that those thoughts we're having in that internal conversation are as honorable to God as they should be. You're not alone in that. Your thoughts are just like our thoughts. We love you. We want you to be in right standing with our God. And whatever there might be that's presenting, preventing us from being able to be right with Him, it's small compared to Him. Let's not let it hold us back any longer. Please come as together we stand and sing.